Welcome to the second of the videos on NumPy and Matplotlib, NumPy Arrays. In this video I'm going to introduce the simplest of those, the one-dimensional array, and how you can construct objects of that sort. So as this slide here says, the key to NumPy is this so-called ND array data type, which stands for n-dimensional array, and we're going to start with n equals 1, that is one-dimensional arrays. These are sort of superficially similar to Python lists, but not too similar if you look closely. Let's have a go. Here's a piece of code. I'm going to run that just to give me a bit of a few useful variables to work with. And it gave me that very important line, import numpy as np. So I'm now going to go uh, data is equal to np.array. That's the constructor for a numpy array. And I'm going to pass in the parameter nums, which is a Python list. It's a Python list of integers to be specific, and what I get out looks sort of like a Python list of integers, except it has array thingy in the front of it. If I print it, it looks slightly different. It comes out with, without the word array, but without the commas as well. This avoids confusion with a numpy, uh, sorry, with a Python ordinary list. So how is this different from a list? Well, the first thing is, it, as over here, it's a fixed size, at least sort of fixed. You can tweak it, but we won't be doing much of that. It's more or less fixed. It has no append method. It has no pop method. It has no remove method. That's the first difference. The second thing is that all the elements of the array have the same type. Just to try to illustrate that, and jumping ahead a little bit, if I were to say data of 2 is equal to um, 0.798, Let's make it 3.798 to make life a little more interesting. If I look at the data now, it's got a 3 in the appropriate position, not a 3.798. It quietly threw that away because we said this, or we have constructed an array of integers. If I want to know what the type is, I can ask for it by printing the d-type of the array. In this case, I'm told it's d-type int 32. If you look over here at the slide, it says integers are 64-bit fixed size. Bit, I hope you realise, stands for binary digit. So there it says 64-bit, here it says int32. The problem is that on Windows, uh, you tend to get 32-bit integers by default, whereas on Linux, which is what you're using in the labs, and MacOS, you'll get 64-bit integers. 32 isn't really quite enough, to be honest. These things are fixed size. That means that you've only got so many digits. In this case, around about 9 or 10. In this case, over here, getting up to about 20. 20 digits is quite a lot. There's a 20-digit odd number. That, that's the range of 64-bit integers, but the range of 32-bit integers is only half of that. In fact, to be more precise, the largest number you can have is 2 to the power of 31 minus 1, which is that, which is kind of large, but maybe not large enough. So try to work with these if you can, and one of the ways you can work with them is to pass in an extra parameter when you construct the thing by saying dtype equals np.int64. That guarantees the type I get. Now if I look at my data, it's 64-bit integers. It says so there when I ask for its information. Now I can also change it to a floating point. So I can say if I construct it, I want, uh, I want floats. So I can so np.float here. If I look at the data now, it's floating point numbers. Usually in NumPy, by default, things will be floating points. They only came out as integers because the input data was all integers. If I were to run that statement to create the data, uh, with this one here using nums f, which is an array, or a list I should say, of integers except for one floating point number buried in there. If I do that and look at the data, it's all floats. So numpy, when you construct an array using Python lists as input, will use floats if any numbers are floats, otherwise it'll use int64 on Linux or uh, Mac OS, and it'll use int32s on Windows just to be annoying. So that's one way to create NumPy arrays using Python lists as input. There's a few others which are documented on the slide here that I want to run through. So np.zeros is a fairly easy way of getting yourself a list of zeros of some sort. I should say an array of zeros, I'm sorry. 20, there's 20 zeros. They're floating point zeros by default. If I wanted integers, I would have to ask for those in, by being explicit. 
in data type is int64. Let's work with int64s if we can. That gives me 20 64-bit integer values, which I could use as counters, for example. Similarly, there's a list of ones, which is just uh, what you'd expect. If I put in a ones in here, I get 64, uh, sorry, 20 64-bit ones. I can fill it with any particular value that takes my fancy. If I want to have an array of, for example, 17 occurrences of the value 19.3, I can do it that way and I get what I asked for, no surprise. Two other functions you should be aware of, which are very important and you'll use a lot, are np.a range and np.lin space. np.a range is a bit like the Python range, very like the Python range, function that you've used a lot. So if I go np.a range from example 1 to 20, you're probably not surprised to get the numbers from 1 up to, but not including 20, just like Python's range. You may not have known, but you can also specify a step size to the range function and also to the A range, which stands for the array range, by the way. And here I get 1, 4, 7, etc. They've gone up in steps of 3. So far, it looks like Python's range function, except, of course, the result is an NP array, not a Python list. Well, even a Python range object, which it actually was. So if I wanted to instead um, use floating point numbers, well, you can't do that in Python's range function. You can do it in this one. If I got, want to go from 0.5 up to 23.7 in steps of 0.9, that's fine in NumPy. There they are. But of course, they only go up to but not including that number. Although, just to, be, to warn you about a risk here, occasionally they may, they may include that top number because floating point numbers are a little bit um, flaky around the edges, if you like, and it can be that floating point error means that you inadvertently include that last number. Not very often, but it can happen. And so I generally recommend if you're working with floating point numbers, probably it's the second function you want, which is the linear space function or lin space. So np.lin space, if I said I wanted to go from 0.5 up to some maximum number, 23.7, this time I don't tell it, sorry, I left out a lin there, lin space. This time I don't tell it what the step size is, I tell it how many numbers I want spaced over that interval. So I might want 20 numbers spaced over that interval, and there they are. And the beauty here is that I guarantee to get the right first number, I guarantee to get the right last number, and I know exactly how many numbers I've got between them, nicely uniformly interpolated across that range. So that's some of the ways in which you can construct NumPy, function, uh, NumPy arrays. There are some other ones. You'll come across them maybe later. And the last function I want to look at in this video is the load text video, which is the last way we'll look at of creating a new NumPy array. So if I have a file of text, like this one for example here, which is uh, a little bit difficult to read because it's rows of numbers, it has 12 rows, one for every month of the year. The first one is the number of the first column, I should say, is the number of the month. The second one is how many days are in the month, and the rest are the daily readings for that month. This is Christchurch Rainfalls. So I can read that using uh, numpy.loadText with a, a line like np.loadText, in this case rainfalls2011.txt. I just pass in the parameter to it, and what I get is a numpy 2D array of all that data. Now I don't want 2D arrays because we're not doing them yet, what if we wanted just this column of data? That would be a 1D array, right? Single column. And it turns out I can do that too by specifying an extra parameter here to say use cols equals, and I have to use the zero origin column number. That's column zero. This is column one. If I do that, there I have this column of the data file. Often the sort of data I want to process is CSV data, comma separated values. That's the same file, rainfalls2011.csv, but the separator between the values is now commas. So I can read those as well by adding an extra parameter here, delimiter equals comma, and I, of course, have to change the name of the file to CSV. With that, I get exactly the same as before. 
One thing I'd just like to mention is that when you're dealing with CSV data, if you double click on a CSV data file, you'll open it in probably Excel if you're on Windows or whatever your preferred spreadsheet program is, and you'll miss out on the detail. You won't know what it really looks like. This is what it really looks like, and you can open any such file in Wing by going File, Open, and when you get the option of files of type something, by default it'll be, whoops, sorry, by default it will be Python, and you have to change to all files to see all the data files as well, the CSV and the text there, for example. So that's all I have time for in this video. See you in the next one. Bye.